the page. Uh, my guest today is Pierre Burton, a very well-known figure in the Canadian literary establishment. He's examined Canadian history and re-examined Canadian history, and he's here today with a tale to tell. Welcome. Hi. Nice to be here, Leslie. I want to talk about things that went wrong in the history of Canada first. <laughs> um, fish, in your new book, Sea Coasts, you, you document some of the things that have gone oh, wrong along the coast. It's really a tragedy. It's a cod here. It's a salmon out there in Sabohwed whale farther north. And the story is the same story. Greed is the story. Too many people fishing for too few fish. Uh, with, with the connivance of the politicians who lie to them and pretend there's more fish than there really are and who don't have really any f sensible way of finding out how many fish there are and apparently don't want to. It's also the, these huge, in this problem, province, as you know. It's those huge dragger ships that come in and tear up the ocean floor and take every kind of fish in the world and throw them all away except the cod. Well, what do you expect is going to happen, you know? Do you think we might learn from our uh, mistakes from we the past? We have not they, learned. We have no. not learned. We have, we, you, you would, I don't know, it's, I, I fish for coho in the west coast sometimes in the summer. And we used to get our limit without any trouble. The limit was, you could take four a day for per person, so four guys could take 16 fish out of the water. Now, there's no coho left. If you try to fish for one, you're not allowed to have a barb in your hook, which I think is good, because you can't catch any that way very easily. But that's what's happened, and they're going to have to clamp down even firmer. I mean, it's very politically very unpopular to say people you can't fish when your whole life is born, is built up in fishing. And the government really has to come in and say, well, here's a substitute for the moment. Yes. But unless they do that, unless they really clamp down tough, there be no fish. They're not going to come back easily, I don't think. Mm, let's go back or all the way around the horn and look at the, um, the major problems. What about with the whales? What happened to whales in Canada? Well, what happened to whales was in the 19th century, there was no plastic, but there was whalebone or baleen, which is that curtain of um, the, the plastic stuff that comes down and yes. catches all the fish in the whale's belly. And very useful for fashion, apparently. Useful for everything, from, from fishing rods to corsets, you know. Everything was made of whalebone. Yeah. Now, it's not made now. We don't need whalebone anymore, which is just as well since there ain't no whales anymore, you know. And that's a, I think that the, in that case, the Aboriginal people were, were as responsible as the white men for the loss of the whales. They went out and fished for them. Uh, it was their life, and uh, nobody told them to stop, and uh, one day there were no whales left. Of course, I there was whaling East Coast, Arctic, and West Coast. This was yeah. all three coasts All three coasts, yeah. Mm -hmm. And all the, the bowhead whale was caught off Herschel Island. After it ran out in the east, they started taking it in the west, and it's gone from there now. And there aren't any left of that, of that particular whale. It's a wonderful whale, you know. Its head is the size of my living room. That's how big it is, and that's just the head. So, uh, we, you know, we've made these incredible mistakes over. Was there any kind of repairs to the, the, the ecosystem? I'm sure they didn't use that word in the 19th century, but did anybody have any sense of, of trying to repair or to bring back the stock? I don't, I haven't found that there was much worry about the stock. Most people thought it would be the, around forever. Yeah. You know, it's like the pine forests I wrote about in the book on the Great Lakes, with the enormous pine forests which people thought were, would never go away and they were all cut down within 50 years. Mm -hmm. Of course, we have the, the same kind of problem as you were mentioning here on the East Coast with cod, uh, the decimation of the cod stocks. Northern uh, cod, yeah. Yeah, happens within a century, but there's a, a fairly straight line in that history from the beginning to the end. What happened was te technological quote, progress, unquote, which is nothing of the kind. But they invented ways of getting fish faster and cheaper and larger. And the draggers was a single, was it one system, but the, uh, the cod uh, went the way of, uh, of the emu or the, you know, because uh, people didn't consider that these new methods of, of catching them was devastating, which it was. We knew better at the time that was happening. Of course happening. we knew better. Right. You just had to look out and see how many fish were being caught. 
And these cod were marvelous, but they're gone now. Uh, a similar story is being played out on the West Coast, yet with the salmon yeah, that are left. That's right. And again, I'd say, well, we can learn from our mistakes. So we've got a chance They're there. getting very tough, but they're not getting tough enough. There are five species of salmon in the West Coast. And the ones, the commercial one that, that they're worried about is the sockeye. And the other, the sports fish, is the, um, the coho. Now, the problem they face is this, that the sockeye is, is a natural resource, which is through been the basis of canned salmon all over the world. But the, and they catch an awful lot of sockeye. But the real money for the province and for everybody else is in sports fishing now, not in commercial fishing. So they've got to stop both. And uh, we're having a fight with Alaska at the moment, as you know, because um, they're more worried about who's taking the fish than how many fish are being taken. And I think that's silly too. Hmm, I noticed that in uh, your book here, you, of course, remind us that Canada has the longest coastline of any country in the world. Yeah. But that we're not a maritime people. Is that tied in with this pro problem that we sort of can't see ourselves as a seagoing nation? We don't. I don't think we see ourselves as a seagoing nation. We're a continental nation, and mm -hmm. most of us, you know, are, are live between the the, uh, the sea coasts. Um, also, we're not a fish-eating nation except in Quebec because we're not, we're a Protestant nation. And only the Catholic areas do they eat a lot of fish. I remember in Toronto, there was no fish sold at all when I first came to Toronto. There was, there was right? only one fish restaurant in Toronto. While on both sides of Toronto, in Montreal and Buffalo, fish uh, restaurants abounded. And the reason was that the people ate fish on Friday. Hmm. So how could this be, though, that we didn't see ourselves as a maritime country and we focused inward, navel-gazing toward the center of the continent? There was a time when, uh, during the building of sailing ships and so on, that we were, in a sense, a maritime country, because don't forget the Cunard Line started here, and uh, et cetera. But I don't think you can think of yourself as a maritime country if you live on the prairies, and your um, staple is wheat. Yeah. And we've seen, always seen ourselves since the, since the turn of the century as a wheat-growing nation, a wheat-exporting nation. We talk about wheat pools and we have elevators along the railway tracks and everything else. We think, it's a, we think in terms of wheat because wheat has have been an enormous asset ever since Charles Saunders invented Marcus Wheat. And that's uh, what, what we live on, wheat and, lo and logs and pulpwood and that sort of stuff. So fishing is fairly well down the line, I think. And marginalized along the way. I think so. And marginalized now terribly. Yeah. Uh, native peoples in Canada who lived along the coast, of course, saw themselves as, as seagoing people. And uh, in your book, you document some interesting things about um, Native people, especially on, on the west coast yes. of Canada. Tell me a little bit about their lives and how they were tied to the sea, the Haida or, or other The Haida, the Kwakiutl, there's a lot of them. Uh, they were tied to the salmon. What happened is during the salmon run, which is a, an enormous spectacle if you've ever seen it, the, the rivers are jammed with salmon. During the salmon run, you could catch enough fish and dry them and smoke them for the rest of the year. So you only worked one month out of the year. You had 11 months where you could sit around and carve totem poles or anything else. They were wonderful carvers because they had the cedar. And the cedar is a soft, beautiful wood, easy to carve. So what grew out of the salmon industry was, uh, it was um, out of this lotus land, which it was then and still is in many people's minds, what grew out of it was, that was the West Coast art, which is unique and gorgeous and is now becoming noticed by the, by the world, the same as Eskimo art. But uh, West Coast uh, art uh, fills museums all over the country and with, and with good reason. Yeah, this is really um, a society, or, or many different societies out there, that had tremendous amount of leisure oh. compared to Europeans or, or other Native North Americans. A certainly. total leisure society, at which the basis of which was the potlatch, which I've written about in the book. Tell me a bit about potlatches. The potlatch was a huge party that one wealthy Aborigine gave. You give stuff away. In which he g gained social status by giving presents. Uh, rather like we do, you know. When you think of the, of the Indian societies and our societies, it's, there's some parallels there. 
But the, it went crazy because uh, in order to gain status, they gave more and more away. In fact, they destroyed stuff. They'd buy bales of Hudson's Bay blankets and chop them in half. They'd throw no, stuff I in the that, ocean. I saw that picture, yeah. It's just yeah, the well, idea of giving things away. That gives yourself more oh, status, yeah, you, but it, you have It can no beggar you, but it doesn't matter. You're yeah. a big guy. And there are some famous potlatches where this happened. Mm -hmm. Uh, very foolishly, the politicians and the, and the missionaries who don't know enough to keep their noses out of other people's business went in and said, oh, this is awful. These people are lazy. They're not working. This is the cal terrible Calvinist work ethic, which, you know, we all have on our shoulders like, a, like the Atlas Mountains. Uh, hell, why do they have to work? Why couldn't they be artists? I mean, what's wrong with how they had culture, which is more than you can say from for most ab a lot of other Aboriginal peoples. So they were like, outlawed, weren't they, along the way, potlatches? Well, they have, the, the potlatches were outlawed, and then they had a hide in the woods. <laughs> Just one moved deep in the woods and continued, but uh, the uh, potlatches went, were banished for, I've forgotten how many decades. They came back in the 1920s or 30s, and they have them now, but they're a little less um, ex ex extreme as they were then. It must have seemed insidious to the, uh, the businessmen, the English businessmen trying to set up posts oh. there to sell goods for profit. The idea of giving all your stuff away it, it, goes uh, directly the, the, against it. The, the newcomers from Europe couldn't understand that at all. This, yeah. You know, and this, especially those who were raised, the Scots were the explorers and who came there first and who were Calvinists to a T, you know. They, they thought you worked for the greater glory of God. But uh, that was a different God. In what way were those, uh, those peoples who lived along the coast before Europeans settled there, what were their, their spiritual beliefs that are tied to the sea? Well, the most important, I guess, mo uh, one of the most important element was the canoe, which was carved uh, with various symbols which were for them mystic or religious whatever, or spiritual or what you call it. But this was a canoe society and these huge war canoes, you know, which were sometimes as many as 50 paddlers, if my memory is, so, is correct. But mm -hmm. they, they, these beautiful, and they, they so the, the canoes were themselves a, a kind of religious object. But they had, the, they had their own the gods, the raven being the most important one, the one you hear most about, who are all, all shown in these totem pole figures are, are some of the spiritual leaders. Uh, it, it changed and differed from, um, from tribe to tribe, from band to band. You know, a place like the Queen Charlotte's, which was Haida country. And the Haida's, I guess, produced the finest art uh, of any uh, in the, on the West Coast because they're isolated from the world. They're like the Galapagos Islands. They have their own, uh, even their own um, ecology because they could, couldn't get to the shore. But uh, all the way down, down to the Nootkas and the others on Vancouver Island. You Societies know. that had a, a fairly strong sense of various kinds of reincarnation, I gather. Yes, they, they had that. They, uh, I can't say that I'm an expert on uh, religious experiences among the Aboriginals. It's complicated because they're all different, That's even right. though they had certain things together, they, they changed. But the, what I like about the West Coast uh, Indians is the carvings that they did, both the small and the large carving is the, the houses, whole houses were carved, you know, with Indian figures. And if you go to British Columbia now, you'll, you can get a lot of your ersatz Indian carvings to take mm -hmm. home. Um, moving north a bit, you know, when we think of the Arctic, uh, most Canadians still have an image of it being bleak and inhospitable and all that sort of thing. But obviously people were, were living in the Arctic long before European explorers came here. How did they get there and, and how did they survive in that climate? They went across what was called Beringia, the Bering Land Bridge. Uh, this was a, a sort of a country within a country. And when this, when the, the the ice age came, the ice sucked up all the water from the oceans, and the ocean levels dropped to the point where in Ber the Bering Strait was, which was a shallow strait anyway. Uh, from that emerged this land bridge across which both animals and people came. And the first people, of course, worked their way down to South America or somewhere. The last people to come were the Inuit, who moved very swiftly because the caribou were scarce. They, they moved wherever the, the food was. That was the incentive. Why that was the, go the east incentive was the, the food, and, and they moved the from, mm -hmm. from west to east in a few hundred years. A remarkable speed for um, transmigration like that. And um, there's, there were, uh, were, as you know, several, there were the, several groups who came over group after group and supplanted in many cases, the group that was there, the Thule culture, yes. which they're examining now, was 
one of the early cultures. Uh, the, the present culture is a mixture of those previous cultures. And of course, this society, these various societies were drastically uh, affected by those whalers and by the explorers that came. Yeah, the, 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 the aboriginal societies in the Arctic were very simple societies. They didn't, I don't think they had any religion that you could really get your finger on, except to survive. Survival was the name of the game, and that made them tough. When the um, traders came, and especially the whalers came, it changed that society because they became themselves whalers and were very good ones. Yes. Okay, thanks, Pierre. We're going to take a short break, and we'll be back with Pierre Burton right after this. Today is Pierre Burton. We're talking about the history of the coastline of Canada. Now, um, you write about the golden age of sail with a certain amount of fondness. This yeah. truly was a unique time in Canadian history. Of course, history, it was. And this, this part of the country is substantially wealthy yes. because they're building so many boats. Every corner, as far as I can find out, every Every curve and every corner, somebody was building a boat. Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, PEI ships. And the, I think the what? mystery is why they stopped when the sail, when the sailboat went out, there was no reason they couldn't have continued to building ships. But they didn't really, did they? Well, I wondered about that. Of course, there's lots of theories about, about steel ships mm -hmm. first taking over and, and engines over. and all of that sort of thing. Steam ships. What do you think life was like aboard one of those sailing ships going from here to South America? Bloody awful. <laughs> you wouldn't want to be there? Oh, no. They had mutinies for that reason. <laughs> no, I wouldn't have worked on a sailing ship. It was hard work, you're away from your home for months and months, sometimes for years. Bad food, I guess. Uh, food was terrible. The, all, the, all you had to drink was bad beer, which is usually in barrels, you know, locally made. They didn't ever drink the water. I, I guess it was brackish and awful. And uh, the work was hard. Uh, I guess the play was hard too when you got to port, but uh, gee, you're down on the waterfront going to the bars and get loaded and be dragged back to the ship you know, a lot of these uh, ships were manned by, I don't know if this happened in the Maritimes, but certainly in Britain, and by press gangs. Just a, a couple of bullies would come through and grab whoever was sitting in the bar, and there were sailors. Sailors who get hanged if they complained or mutinied yes. or anything like that. Now, there was less of that. This was a trading business here, uh, trading down to the Bahamas, a lot of that. And later on, of course, it was smuggling, you know. This was a great smuggling area in the 20s, especially after. And highly romanticized. Oh. And in the Maritimes, this is considered an extremely important part of our, our well, heritage. Well, people are proud smuggling. of it, yeah. Yes. Well, well why, why wouldn't they be? It was a silly law, I mean, to try to st people stop drinking when you could make it in your basement. It's just silly. It's like marijuana. You can grow it. Why? I don't know how they can stop that. I don't know. They, right. they can't. You know, it's just costing thousands of dollars every day for people to go to jail. Right. But that was what was happening during the bootlegging era. We did not have here in the Depression what they had in the States, which was a lot of gunplay. There was not much of that here. It was mainly the, the Coast Guard would fire on you, and they, they shot down the I Am Alone, but that was the way down the South Seas, but there wasn't too much of that. Yeah, so, uh, well, you know, we look back with fondness on those times, although it was incredibly hard both for the men of the, uh, the age, the golden oh, age of terrible, sail, terrible. or for the smugglers even, who uh, it, some of them became very wealthy and bought houses on the South Shore. Um, you write about Sable Island as well. Why, why do ships keep running into Sable Island? Sable Island is a great sandbar. I'm, when I lived in the Yukon, there were sandbars formed every year in the Yukon River, and I'm familiar with the sandbars, and we slept, we not slept, we camped in the sandbars. But the thing about a sandbar is it's just sand. It's hard to grow anything on it. It's hard, and it's not only that, but it's just the peak of the iceberg, as they say, down below the water. This sand stretches out like this, so an, an, a ship that doesn't know where it's going hits that sand and founders. And as you know, the, the, the toll of ships, especially sailing ships, around Sable Island, it's like a freeze of, of, of wrecked ships. You can, there's pictures of it, and there's... No, no place where the ship hasn't been wrecked. Yeah, well, I find close. I find Sable Island absolutely fascinating, geologically in every sense, you know. And Canadians went out there in the 19th and in the 20th century to set up life-saving stations for oh, all yes. these these poor sailors. They who had to crashing into it. 
Yes, and they saved a lot of people's lives by having them there. And they've got the horses, of course, that everybody talks about. I didn't talk much about the horses in the book, but uh, these wild horses, which have been there for two or three hundred years and have, have managed to survive in the sand, they're quite interesting. They're shaggy, you know. Hmm. Pierre, let me ask you, how did you become so thoroughly entangled with Canadian history? It began with a book called Klondike. I was, I'd, I'd written a couple of books. In fact, I got a Governor General's Award for the Mysterious North, which was um, part history, part travel through the North. And I was looking around for something to do, and I was asked by Macmillan to contribute to their series of bestsellers for boys and girls. And I wrote uh, The Golden Trail, which was a kind of a, a pilot project for the later book, because then I thought, I, I must have another book. What was it going to be? And I thought, well, you should write about what you know. I was raised in the Klondike. A lot of the books I read about the Klondike were inaccurate from a geographical point of view, at least. So I wrote the book, and I loved it. I really enjoyed it, because I'm from there, and I knew the, the terrain, and I knew the people. And it was a very successful book. It was my first really successful book, and I just, I liked it so much, I just got on to, to doing that kind of book. I, and here you are, how many books later? This is 43, or 44, this is 44, I think. 44. Yeah. It's a good, good round number. Are you a Canadian nationalist? I think so, sure. I'm proud to call myself that. A lot of people think it's a slur, but I don't. I think mm -hmm. I, I'm a nationalist in the, in the sense that some people in the early century were imperialists, you know. Yeah. What elements of Canadian culture do you worry the most about in terms of erosion? Oh, I think the uh, visual arts, which are the most powerful of all, the, of, of all the things that contribute to our culture, the, mm -hmm. the visual arts, by which I mean television and films, and to some extent painting, I suppose, but I'm thinking mainly of, the, of, the, uh, of television and films. And we're losing ground? I think we're losing ground. I think it's a damn shame. It's, that's how you create myths. You can only create myths by widescreen uh, movies, you know, Bad movies create myths, but it doesn't mean it doesn't matter. The United States has produced thousands of bad movies, yes. you know, and good ones too. But it's the bad movies that have gone out of the skin of the people. It's the story of Wyatt Earp, which is nonsense, you know, and all this. But it still it gives you a, it gives you a feeling you know something about what where you came from. And even though the movies are bad, even though the, they're mixed up and everything else, they still work and they still tell people who they are. Hmm. In Canada, you know, I often think that we know so little about the, the North, yet there's something about the Arctic and the very presence of all of that wilderness well, that's area our, that that's our makes great us myth. The, the myth of the yeah. Arctic, the myth of the Northwest Passage and the search for the North Pole and the Franklin Expedition, which was a bloody disaster run by fools, but still it's part of our myth. Yeah. It's just, you know, people don't have to be heroes to have a, a, to have a myth. I don't, and, and a myth doesn't necessarily have to be true, without it can be true, and some of the better ones are. But uh, I've, and I, as you know, have written about this. I've, uh, the Claude Knight Gold Rush is a wonderful myth making. It's yes. true, but it's, it's fascinating. It's something in our background that we have that nobody else has. Nobody else has anything quite like the Klondike. Nobody else has anything like the Search for the Northwest Passage, which I've already also written about. Uh, Pierre, thanks for that. We're going to take a, uh, another short break, and we'll be back right after this. back on Off the Page. My guest today is Pierre Burton. Uh, Pierre, we've done such a poor job protecting our coastal creatures. Is there anything we can do to fix things up? Well, I think people ought to listen to the, uh, especially to the young people, who are the ones that are active in this. They should listen to the activists. I have my doubts in many ways about Greenpeace. I don't like what they did with the seals. I think they're dead wrong there. But in other areas, they're dead right. Okay. I thank you very much for that. Okay, Leslie. My nice guest has been you. Pierre Burton, and thanks for watching Off the Page. See you again next time. Mm -hmm.